Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, so yeah, right. My name is Mary Donovan. I just finished my PhD at the University of Hawaii, and um, I'm still working at the university. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Feels pretty good. <laughs> uh, so you can see PhD up there. I got to use that for the first time. So um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'll be talking a little bit about my dissertation work, but also some work I've been in, uh, involved with as a collaboration called the Ocean Tipping Points Project. Um, I'll introduce the project, and you'll even get to see a video. Uh, this project was uh, involved f over 50 people all over the world, um, and we had a team here in Hawaii that was specifically studying Hawaii's reefs and tipping points here. And so I'll mostly be talking about that, but kind of giving a big intro to what tipping points are and using some of the things we've we've learned. Um, so up on the top represents kind of just a few of the uh, the organizations that were involved in this project. So like I said, this isn't just my research, so I also wanted to acknowledge my collaborators. This is um, just the names of the people who worked in Hawaii, so there's even more than this that I'm not mentioning. Um, and again, we were uh, a bunch of us here at UH and, and also NC in Santa Barbara uh, was kind of where the project was based out of. So I wanted to start uh, by thinking about what I mean by the word tipping point. So we define this as large and sometimes abrupt changes, often that occur without warning in our ecosystems, that are often very difficult to reverse and have cascading impacts on our economy and society, with the key being that last point. So you can see here the reef on your left is a nice thriving reef, coral rich, abundant <laughs> fish. Um, and the reef on the right is uh, typical of a degraded reef, so um, kind of no coral except for maybe one dying coral there in the middle and not a fish in sight and covered in algae. And so this represents kind of a classic tipping point on a reef where the reef on the left is going to have a lot more benefits for our society. So people may uh, be able to go fish for their food for dinner or um, like we're here in Hanama Bay um, and have a great recreation site that's important for our economy. And so um, this kind of pattern is what we're interested in studying because we really want to avoid shifting uh, from the left to the right. So it turns out tipping points are actually really common. So this is one of the uh, outcomes of the Larger Ocean Tipping Points Project. They did a big review all over the world of uh, where tipping points were occurring and where we had evidence of that. And so uh, the graph is just showing that essentially um, at least half of all of the relationships studied in the ocean that involve humans interacting with our ecologies of our oceans, um, at least half were nonlinear, which is um, the, another word for a tipping point. And these tipping points can occur in all sorts of different ecosystems. Coral reefs are actually very commonly used as an example of tipping points, but uh, as are kelp forests, where you could have a kelp rich to an urchin barren um, type of tipping point, but tipping points also occur in all these other ecosystems, oyster reefs, seagrasses, rocky intertidal. And tipping points also occur all over the world. So again, in a review done by our larger project, they, they looked at all the marine habitats around the globe and documented these ecosystem shifts. And as you can see from the dots, um, the colors represent different kinds of ecosystems. And the and you can see it, it spans the whole world. But let's get back to coral reefs, which is going to be what I'll, I'll be mostly talking about today. Uh, here's just a few of the titles of some papers that have come, come out over the last couple of decades uh, showing that there's been a huge decline in coral reefs worldwide. We often document this decline strictly thinking about declines in coral cover um, as an indicator of these potential tipping points. Um, and throughout the talk, we'll talk about kind of how to relate coral cover back to tipping points. Um, and I just wanted to give a really classic example. And um, this is used in textbooks to describe tipping points and is a, one of the more sad stories in the world. Um, this is from Discovery Bay, Jamaica. Uh, the picture on the top was uh, taken in 1975. Um, so it's black and white, so uh, think of it in color. And that's just a beautiful coral rich reef. Um, with fishes swimming around and, you know, if it was a color photo, very clear water. And this is the same place today. Um, you can't really see a coral mostly dominated by soft corals and algae. 
And the data on the right is uh, showing the pattern um, that was observed. So this was uh, data by Terry Hughes for his dissertation. And he started in the late 70s going out and counting corals and, and algae. And you can see as the over the years he was doing his PhD, as the coral decline, the macroalgae increased. And this was this kind of classic regime shift or tipping point on the reef that occurred right around 1983. And so kind of with all that, those examples in mind, I wanted to kind of talk about the science behind this and the theory that's established for why this is occurring in our ecosystems. And it's, um, it's centered around the word resilience. And resilience was defined by Hollings in 1973 as the capacity of an ecosystem to withstand disturbance without changing its identity in terms of its structure and function. So that's a little deep, so let's break that down a little bit. Um, so again, we have this example of a reef shifting, shifting from coral to algae. So that's, you know, we want to stay on the left and avoid the right. And we can use this kind of diagram uh, where the ball represents the state of the ecosystem now. And so we want to, if that basin where the ball is, is deep, then it's hard to push that ecosystem out of that, of that state. So you could have a disturbance, let's say it's a hurricane, and the reef will either be able to bounce back and kind of stay in its current state, which is a coral-dominated environment, or if the resilience is threatened or declines, then the steepness of that cup lowers, and you can push the ecosystem into the other state. And so it's that lowering of that, of that cup that we're really interested in. What are the mechanisms? What are the underlying causes of um, and and things that are occurring in the ecosystem that are allowing that to happen. And so that's what we're really studying here. So I just kind of wanted to walk through the ecology of a coral reef a little bit, uh, but a little bit slowly to think about what are some of those mechanisms that may relate to that change from coral to algae. And so um, the first is direct relationships between the macroalgae. So if the algae are um, increasing in their dominance on the bottom, they're directly competing with the coral. And so this direct interaction is can be negative. So uh, macroalgae have been shown to cause increases in coral disease, which ultimately leads to coral death. Um, they also can just directly smother the coral. So just grow right over the coral and the coral needs sunlight. So that'll also cause it to die. So that's a direct way in which the algae can have a negative effect on coral. There's also an indirect way in which, and that's just the direct competition for space on the bottom. Space is a limited resource and coral need particularly bare space in order to recruit and, and grow new coral. And so um, if those algae are taking over that bare space then there's no new space for the corals to establish. And that's again related to what we call coral recruitment. So that's new corals coming in and making more coral um, that goes into adult corals and then again produces more baby corals. So um, you can start to see a loop forming. And then there's also the relationships with the rest of the ecosystem, such as the fishes. So the corals are really important for providing habitat and structural complexity that give the fish a good place to live. So for example, the little fish need a place to hide so that the big fish can't catch them. And then the big fish like to be where the little fish are, so it kind of creates this you know, thriving ecosystem. And there's also different components of the fish that uh, fish assemblage that relate to this relationship between the corals and algae. Uh, the, the fish that I've just highlighted are all known, are, are herbivores that feed either directly on the algae. Um, so we have things like the scrapers and those are our big parrotfish. You may have heard that the big parrotfish are particularly important for reef resilience because they not only eat the algae, but they also create that bare space, which we can see is in the kind of center of this loop. And we really need that because they have these big jaws and they can scrape on the bottom. And that creates bare space. There's also the grazers that keep the algae low. So grazers are like surgeon fish and they're just constantly out there mowing the lawn and keeping the algae really small in, in a, what we call turf, which you've definitely seen out here in the bay and that kind of nice turf is a good, is a good thing. 
Um, and then there's the browsers. Um, they can actually eat the big macroalgae. So they're really important for um, if the algae becomes established, keeping that low. Um, examples of browsers in, in our, on our reefs are chubs or um, nainui. Um, there's also some um, species of parrotfish that browse. And so these herbivores are super important because obviously they have a direct relationship on the algae and then the bare space. But there's also the secondary consumers, um, and that's kind of all the other fish. So I've kind of thrown the butterfly fish in here, the damselfish, the triggerfish, and they all have the interactions with the rest of the reef and the ecosystem that keep a balance. And then of course the predators, which are important for keeping the trophic structure intact. They you know, continually eat some of the, um, the smaller fish and keep that productivity in the ecosystem going by eating fish, then those fish make more fish, and then we, we continue to, that cycle. So as I mentioned, with all these arrows, we kind of started to form a loop. And so we think of these loops, um, and we call them feedbacks. And feedbacks are really what's critical to the, keeping the ecosystem intact and maintaining all these mechanisms that allow the corals to dominate. And, um, and so that's kind of all of these different aspects we, we study in different ways in order to think about this coral reef resilience and tipping points. So that was kind of a quick uh, coral reef ecology 101. Um, and that kind of brings me to our project. So we, for the ocean tipping points project in Hawaii, we were really after how can we uh, take the appropriate action from a management perspective in order to avoid our reefs tipping into the kind of undesired ecosystem where we lose our benefits. And so the, the key there was identifying the most important actions that we can take to maintain a healthy and resilient reef. So that relates to all of those mechanisms that I was just talking about, but also thinking about how those relate to patterns of, of human impacts. And so that's what I'll mostly be talking about. And we did this all in light of the idea that once a tipping point is crossed, it's actually much harder to recover than it is to avoid it in the first place. And so that's really critical. So when I keep talking about our results, um, thinking about that. So we have both situations in Hawaii um, where we've got degraded reefs, particularly on the south shore of this island, um, but we also have reefs that haven't tipped yet. And so we need to think about different actions um, in order to manage those in light of tipping points. And then that brings us to the actual management. And, um, this is kind of ongoing research, so I don't have as much to present on this today, but it's the ultimate outcome of the project, which is to think about all the different ways that we might be able to take action, and then which ones are gonna have the biggest bang for their buck. And so that's what we're, what we're all working towards. Okay, so this project is pretty large. As you saw, there was you know, 30 people working on it, and I'm gonna try to explain most of what we found in the last four years. And, the next half hour or so. So I'm gonna break it down into kind of some of the different components. The first was in order to understand the impacts on the ecosystem and whether those impacts were related to tipping points, we needed to be able to measure human impacts. And so a huge part of this project, the first two to three years was quantifying and mapping human impacts on the marine environment in Hawaii. So I'm gonna show you some pretty cool maps that we made. Next was, in order to relate that back to the ecosystem, we needed to be able to understand what was going on on our reefs and characterize the ecosystem in terms of tipping points. And so I'll talk about our research on, on mapping and understanding the ecology. And then uh, finally, it's bringing those two together. So identifying which drivers were important for each of those ecosystems and then um, how that relates to tipping points. And then finally, the important part, which is uh, supporting the uptake of this information, both for the public as well as our state uh, management agencies and, um, and, and ultimately translating this to conservation. So I'll end with that. Okay, so that's where we're going. And I'm gonna start with that first part, which is again, quantifying and mapping the drivers of the near shore environment. So first, when I talk about drivers, I'm really thinking about those human impacts. So there's a whole slew of human impacts on the ecosystems um, that we've all observed. So this 
includes fishing, but also near shore development. Hawaii Kai is a very good example of that. Um, we also have impacts on land that are affecting the oceans, such as nutrients and sediment coming through our watersheds. Uh, we also studied the impact of invasive species and what we called habitat modification, which was um, the hardening of our shorelines mainly. So again, think Hawaii Kai. <laughs> uh, but we also studied the uh, non-human drivers of our ecosystems. Hawaii is a very diverse place in terms of the uh, biophysical uh, in ecosystem that we have. Um, so, for example, we have very large waves hitting our north shores this weekend, uh, but we also have variation in the temperature of the water, irradiance, which is the amount of light that's penetrating at depth. That changes as we move across the archipelago, as well as chlorophyll A, which is a measure of productivity um, in the open ocean. And so we also um, were able to map those statewide for the first time to think about how all these things interact. So uh, this is just kind of an example of some of the first maps um, of the biophysical drivers. Uh, so this is building on Jamie Gove's PhD. And um, again, this is the first time that these are all really mapped at the scale in which we needed the data to be able to really drill down and understand the relationships with reefs. So that's a pretty big feat and some really cool data. Um, we also studied uh, those human impacts I just listed for you. I don't have time to go through the maps um, all together, but I did want to show you one that was kind of neat and new. Um, so this was this is nutrient flux from on-site waste disposal systems. So how this was mapped was based on a data source from the Department of Health, who knows where every single on-site waste disposal, so that's like a cesspool, for example, is in the state. Um, and then some researchers at the university actually measured the flux of nutrients coming out of those uh, cesspools into the ground. And then we were able to extrapolate that into the ocean. And so you can see the little dark spots around the island are where the impact from those on-site waste disposal is greatest. And that's generally related to the density of the cesspools in that area. So um, can you see my mouse? OK, yeah. So uh, around Black Point is one of the most heavily impacted areas, which is interesting. So there's a lot of cesspools there. Um, the North Shore of Oahu is actually um, the highest density in the entire United States. Um, and um, there's also some large impacts along the Kona Coast. And because of the scale of the island, it doesn't look as big. But particularly around Puako and downtown Kailua Kona um, are pretty heavily uh, Heavily impacted. So you can see here that this now gives us an idea spatially of where this impact is occurring and where it's not. And so we can kind of compare those areas. And uh, so, as I mentioned, there's maps like those in depth maps that I just showed for all sorts of different variables. And um, one of the things that was really important to us was getting this data out into the world. And so all of those maps are actually freely available and you can download and explore them yourselves on this website. Um, if you haven't heard of PAC IUS, I imagine um, they've come and talked here before, so maybe you have, but um, is a great website and resource for us here in Hawaii. And they uh, are a portal for all of this data. So. Uh, they first have this nice website uh, for our, just our project. So this is also a place where you can find out more information. I'm going to give you a couple of places. Um, and I'll give you this website again. I also have it written down. And the great thing about this website is they have this portal. So if you're familiar with like Google Maps, it's pretty much the same interface. And you can go in and you can click on any of our data products and zoom around and zoom in to buy your house or where you want to go swimming or um, fishing and, and check it out. So I encourage everybody to do that. Um, the data is also downloadable if you're interested in using it for another, um, another project. I also just wanted to quickly mention that we also combined all of those data layers into what we call a cumulative impact map. The cumulative impact takes into account all the different drivers on the ecosystem, as well as the vulnerability of the habitats. So for example, a coral reef may be more vulnerable to land-based pollution than say sand. Um, so 
this this map actually incorporates all of those. It's 20 something human impacts, as well as the habitat um, around the entire state and shows where the cumulative impact, so the sum of all of those um, layers is the greatest. And so, as you can imagine, the South Shore of Oahu is, is the most heavily impacted, but there's also some surprising um, patterns and, um, and concerning places that we can keep our eyes on throughout the state. Okay, so now we have all those great maps of where the human impacts are and where the natural variation is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, what did I mean by impact? Is it just purely the amount or is it the amount per person uh, or some other metric? Um, this is the, the amount, so the summed impact. So everything was um, also weighted um, based on which impacts are worse than others. So, um, so those got heavier weights than some others. Does that make sense? Okay, so now we have those maps of where the impacts are as well as the variation just biophysically around the state. And so now we need um, the same kind of characterization of the reefs and of the ecology in order to relate those two together. So we approach this with this idea that reefs can have many configurations or not all reefs look the same. So each of these is a picture of a reef from the main Hawaiian Islands. And we can see that, for example, we can have a place with a lot of coral, but not necessarily a lot of fish. We can have a place with a lot of fish, but not necessarily a lot of coral. We can have a place with just one big fish. Uh, we can also have a place with neither. And so we needed a way of really capturing both the variation in the, the bottom or the benthos that in terms of the algae and the coral and the other components of the benthos as well as the fish. And so that's what we really set out to do. And in order to do this, we also needed a lot of data. So a lot of data is kind of the theme of this presentation. Um, and this is one of the parts of the project I led, which was taking um, the vast amount of information we have on our um, near shore ecosystems and combining it into one place. So each of these, uh, these Organizations conduct underwater visual surveys, so scuba divers go out and count what's on the bottom and how many fish there are um, at each of the little dots all over the state. Um, and actually, there's a lot more than you can even see because they're all overlapping each other. And um, as you can see with all the colors together, that when we combine this, we have a really powerful story that gives us a really strong spatial and temporal, I'm not showing you the temporal um, picture, but of, of our near shore ecosystems. So we used all of these data to characterize what we called reef regimes. Um, we did this using a statistical approach that combines, again, the, the idea of what's going on on the bottom, as well as the different components of the fish community um, into a cluster analysis that allowed us to think about how all of those different variables come together to, to paint different pictures. And what we found is that there's five different kinds of reefs in the main Hawaiian Islands, which we, again, call regimes. And I'll just walk you through slowly because I have them all up there at once. Uh, and starting with the green one on the top, which uh, we've kind of termed the degraded regime. This really falls into our classic picture of a degraded ecosystem, which is devoid of fishes and corals, mostly covered in algae, and also tends to be pretty shallow and flat. So flat meaning that all of the ecosystem structure and that habitat that the fish like, fish -like have de degraded. Uh, we also have uh, what we're calling a complex boulder reef. If you've gone snorkeling up in uh, Pupu Kea, this is a great example of that. It's uh, generally a place with re really big basalt kind of uh, boulders and really nice habitat complexity, but not necessarily high coral cover. Um, maybe a few corals here and there, but can have a ton of fish. And so this is really characteristic of our north facing shores. Um, and then we had three other regimes, which may have all kind of been thought of as a, just a typical coral reef before, but actually have distinct differences. 
Um, the first is we're calling this intact. So that's kind of our classic picture of a really nice reef. So really good coral, no algae, and lots of fish. Um, and a, a classic example for, for the main Hawaiian Islands is Koholawe, although I haven't been there. I don't know if you guys have. Um, we also have what we're calling a typical Hawaiian reef. And the reason we're calling it that is because finger coral is common, and that's a really kind of common distinct habitat. Um, and these, these reefs tend to have kind of moderate fish biomass. They tend to occur close to where people are just because that's kind of um, typical in Hawaii, and then, but, but can have high coral cover. Um, these reefs are also have the least variability. And what that means is if I was to go swim at one of them and then go to a different one, I was going to see something very similar. And that's different from the pink one, which we're calling transitional. And that um, reef has really variable fish and benthic structure. So if you go to two, you're really not necessarily going to see the same thing. And the reason I call it transitional, I'll get to in a little bit later, but it's one of the reefs we think may be on the edge of a tipping point. OK, so yes. Kahikili is on Maui. Uh, Kahikili is on West Maui, um, near Ka'anapali. It's in the Ka'anapali. And it's also uh, was recently um, designated as a marine life conservation district, if that sounds familiar. It's an herbivore replenishment area. Is that familiar? OK. Um, other typical uh, places would be um, a lot of the Kona Coast would be a, this yellow regime. Um, uh, Hanama Bay also has some of that habitat. What about, where's Pelicani? Pelicani Bay is on the Kona Coast. It's up um, north, in North Kohala. Yeah, it's a little bay. And um, actually, it has. it's one of the only places on the Kona Coast where a river lets out. Um, so there's a lot of sedimentation right by the harbor. Where a river actually... Um, lets out on the Kona coast. Otherwise, all the water flows the other way on the big islands. So yeah, good questions. Um, I'll try to, I can give you some Oahu. Well, um, Hanama Bay also has some of the pink one, the transitional bay, and, um, and as well as um, specifically around Diamond Head. Um, but most of South Oahu, well, actually, this is my next slide. Ha. <laughs> OK, um, so here's a map. And again, they're all, a lot of the points are overlapping, so you can't see them all. Um, but in general, we had a kind of an equal distribution of all five of the types of reefs uh, around the main, the main Hawaiian Islands. Um, but some interesting patterns, which I'm going to summarize by island just to make it easier. Um, here, I'll use my pointer. So first, you might notice the orange pie is biggest up in the northwest and smallest in the southeast. That was the what we call a complex boulder. Um, I described that as like pupukea, so big boulders with not necessarily high coral cover, but a lot of fish. That those tend to occur on our north facing shores, which makes sense why they increase in abundance as you go to the northwest. So our our northwest islands get kind of those bigger waves than our more sheltered southeast islands. Uh, the other interesting pattern is the green pie. That's the degraded reef. And as you can see, more than 50% of all of the observations on Oahu were the degraded reef, and particularly on the south shore. Um, other patterns that are interesting are the yellow one. And that was that kind of, we call it a typical or a finger coral reef. And that increases in abundance in the opposite direction of the orange one where um, very commonly found on the Big Islands, particularly on the Kona Coast in a sheltered environment. Okay. And then I just wanted to give one example of how this could be useful for thinking about tipping points and change over time. So everything I've talked about so far is across space. And you can see that um, it's also useful over time. So this is. Uh, Honolulu Bay, which is on West Maui. Um, it's a marine life conservation district that was established in the 1970s. So it's one of our oldest marine life conservation districts, just like here. And um, as you can see, it's very similar. It's a little bit smaller than Hanama Bay. Um, but this is what it looks like um, on the left on a typical day. So it's nice, clear water. 
Um, there's a boat that's taking snorkelers out. Uh, but the middle picture is what it looks like more commonly, especially more frequently now. And it's full of sediment. And that um, kind of change in that picture is also seen with the data with the red bars, where we, we've seen a decline in coral cover from um, up to 42% in the mid-1990s, where it's now less than 10%. And this is actually the first place I ever went snorkeling in Hawaii, so it's kind of um, meaningful to me because I remember just a really beautiful reef, and it's not there anymore. And, uh, and so we can think about this in terms of the regimes like this. So it started off um, all the way up to 2007, so seven years of data as that kind of typical nice finger coral reef. Um, but then starting around 2008, it started to transition, and it became that tr transitional reef first before ultimately declining to a degraded regime in two by 2012. And so this is helpful because if we only were to look at coral cover like we did in the red bars, we only have one story. But in this one, we also found out that not only did it go through the transitional reef first as an indicator that maybe it was about to change, but also it, it went through that orange one. And you said, you're like, well, Mary, you said those are on the north facing shores. Why is it inside this bay? Well, really interestingly, the orange one is a reef that doesn't necessarily have high coral cover, but it has still abundant fish. And so what we think is happening is that the benthos declined first here, and then the fish went with them. So the fish can hang on for a bit longer, as long as that habitat's there. And so a dead coral still provides habitat, but until it ultimately gets eroded away. Um, and so this tells a kind of more complex story of a uh, change on our reefs. And so um, is a kind of helpful way of thinking about tipping points. Okay. Um, yes. Um, it's in Northwest Maui. So uh, where is that? So it's north of Ka'anapali. Just, yeah, just as you're going around the bend. Yeah. Uh, does that make sense? Um, it's right here. Can you see my pointer? <laughs> Okay, right there. Okay, so that was just an example. Um, but now I wanna move on to how we combined this idea of the human impacts on the reefs and, our, and the biophysical with our characterization of the regimes. And so um, we're gonna have a few, a few more graphics in this part of the talk. Uh, the first thing we did was just ask for each regime, which of the variables was most important? And so this ranks the variables where the top one was the most important for each one, and then shows the ones that were statistically significant. We've also colored the bars. So the anthropogenic impacts or the human impacts are kind of orangish, and the more environmental or biophysical impacts are the bluish. And so the first thing you can see is some regimes are far more influenced by humans, and some are far more influenced by their biophysical environment. And so that may mean a few things. Um, for example, regime one was really heavily predicted by both nut and spear fishing. Um, so where we see a lot of fishing, we see a lot of this degraded regime. Um, we also see spear fishing was a predictor of regime five. So that's kind of counterintuitive, but it also shows that, um, that those reefs are occurring in places where people like to spear fish. So it's important as an ecosystem service as well. Um, we also see waves as our top predictor for number two, or the orange one, the complex boulder regime. And that, um, again, was that pattern I, I mentioned already, where we also find those regimes on our north-facing shores where we have a lot of waves. So this gives us some insights into what's most important in which places um, and, and starts to give us an idea of what we can do where. But we also need to think about what are the underlying relationships and are there, are there thresholds or tipping points? And so these graphs show the relationship between, in this case, the degraded regime and nut fishing, and then on, on the other side, the complex boulder regime and the maximum waves. And we see that at a very small amount of fishing, we see this degraded regime more. Um, and, and then at, again, at some minimum amount of wave exposure, we see the, the um, complex boulder regime more. So this starts to give us the shape, which 
tells us whether a tipping point is occurring. We also thought about it in terms of change over time. So as I mentioned that Honolulu Bay example, we were able to follow particular reefs over time and ask which regimes they were. And found some interesting patterns. Um, this is just human population density or the proximity to a population center. And, and that increases as you go to the right. And then the probability of seeing one of these transitions is, is um, on these graphs. So what this means is this first one is re regime one staying regime one. And so that's something we don't want, right? So we, we want to see recovery from the degraded regime. And we see that the probability of getting recovery decreases because we see an increase in the probability of this, that transition happening um, with human population density. On the other hand, Regime two, staying regime two decreases in probability, which is a bad thing because we wouldn't want that regime to change because it's in a good state now. And so by thinking about how those transitions happen in relation to all these human impacts, we can again start to peel away the story of tipping points in relation to the given human impacts on our reefs. Uh, we also did this in terms of the coral bleaching event that happened in 2015. Um, and we saw something kind of interesting, and that was this transition from a typical coral, especially a finger coral reef, to that complex boulder or a reef that maybe has high fish still, but not high coral cover, increased in probability with the heating event. And so that's, again, telling us that story that perhaps the corals went first and the fish are still hanging on. And so we can recover those corals before that habitat is degraded, then we might not lose our fish, which is important for a lot of reasons. OK, so where does it, what does that all mean for what we can do? So we have a couple of take home messages. Uh, the first is that keeping an eye on those pink reefs is a really possibly a very good indicator of where we should pay attention. So these reefs are particularly sensitive to change. We saw they often were changing in that transition analysis. And they're possibly also very responsive to management efforts because they haven't quite tipped yet. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, it's easier to avoid a catastrophic change than it is to recover from one. That brings us to then the recovery from the degraded regime um, may require a lot more effort than just avoiding a tipping point in the first place. Um, so we found that we may need to think about both pollution and overfishing together in order to recover from a degraded regime. So that's a big story for something like Mauna Lua Bay. And then finally, some regimes are really highly influenced by the biophysical factors, so those blue bars. And so we really need to keep that in mind because if there's a really heavy influence of our natural environment, then different changes to our levels of human impact may be harder to, over, harder to achieve um, because we have to um, think about that natural variability in concert with our changes. So something like um, you know, what we need to do on the North Shore of Oahu might be very different from the South Shore. OK, so that um, brings me to the last part of this, which is really taking everything I just said and really translating that into actual action. Um, so we were, that was a big part of our project was interfacing with this, particularly people at the state of Hawaii and the Division of Aquatic Resources um, to support the uptake of that data. And in fact, I'm actually working for them now as part of that transition. So we, um, we did that in a couple of ways. Uh, the first was creating uh, what we call this portal. So you guys can also vi visit this online. Um, I'm going to give you, I have these handouts with our one website that has links to all these other websites, by the way. So um, these are over there. Sorry, I forget. And it's a bookmark. So that's cool. Um, so this portal is really wonderful. It has a whole slew of information, uh, not just about coral reef tipping points, but all of the, the whole bigger project. Um, we broke it down into understanding the tipping points. So what's all that science? And um, if you're curious to review that, 
um, how that relates to management. We also had a slew of lawyers working on this project, which is really neat um, and something different for us. And so there's a whole bit about law and policy, and we really tried to just take the whole leap um, into that kind of action. Um, and then under exploring case studies where, where, is where you'll find the Hawaii information. There's also a um, simultaneous case study in Haida Gwaii in British Columbia, which is a really interesting place that also has a really strong relationship with um, nature and people like we do here in Hawaii. And so there's some cool analogies that you guys all might be interested in. Um, and then finally, the guide. So we also wrote a guide that you can download as a PDF, share with your friends. Um, and this is, it's, it's only about this big. It's, it's not too long, but it really dives in and gives you all the information in depth. And so we created these products as a way of really getting the word out there. Um, the website also is a place for people to interact and, and uh, have conversations about tipping points and um, applications to management. Uh, which we're calling a community of practice. Um, and so with that, uh, I also just wanted to play a quick video that um, gives a chance for some of my partners and um, to talk about the project. So it's pretty quick. Right. The Tipping Points Project is one of my favorite projects because it brings together all of the data that's been collected by everybody during time in our coral reefs around Hawaii. It's been very difficult to gather that information, to answer questions, to know what's been done here before, to reduce duplication of effort, to answer larger questions, to identify resilience and tipping points out on the reef. Places that are in danger of tipping, those are places where we really need to redouble our efforts. So this project has really been able to emphasize where places are doing well, where places could use better management, and where places are just not doing well. We really need to think about how much energy we should put into them to try to rehabilitate them. The first step was to get an understanding of how the reefs were looking at But then, of course, comes the research that is out what environmental uh, stressors and human stressors are responsible for the opening of the state of the reef. The relationship the project is built uh, with the Department of Land and Natural Resources and in particular the Division of Aquatic Resources is very important. Because ultimately, you need an uptake pathway. This is not science for science sake, it's directly meant to benefit the end users of reefs. A big part of our role has been directly facing the management. Um, and trying to figure out that once we know these thresholds, in, and we don't want to cross them, but what are the best ways to avoid not crossing them? What drivers should we be mitigating? Where should we be mitigating? And how? I think what's really clear is there's a lot of information. The tipping point project is compiling that, and that's the kind of collaborations between different um, areas of expertise, pull things together about the models, whatever it may be. When you're looking at resilience indicators, they you know, haven't really seen something that provides the level of information and insight that this project has been able to capture. And I think increasingly we're going to be needing that and relying on it to look at where we prioritize managing things like climate change. Um, and we know we really important, especially given it's something that's happening globally, but we still are responsible for acting on it globally. We now have a, a really comprehensive spatial map of how the national environment is fluctuating, how the activities fluctuate, and how great communities are responding to that. And never before that will be filed. So this data set is is going to be publicly available, and this data set will be, will be useful for all sorts of other research. You know, it's really interesting to hear from members of local communities in Hawaii then they are also really grateful and eager to get their hands on these data sets that will help them gain perspective of how their community, how their day fits into the bigger picture. And they're ready and interested in creating solutions together with the managers and the scientists. The way I see this data is that it's supporting what the communities have said, because the communities have been really strong advocates for standing up and saying, our place is changing, we want to manage it. But I think this data can just step in and support is providing us a baseline. Someone's even providing us training over time to say, not only do we have the community saying this, but we have science saying this. That should be enough evidence for all of us. To
Okay, so that provided a nice little summary of the talk, and you got to hear from some of my colleagues. Um, and then with that, I just wanted to thank like a whole slew of people. And there's a lot of people that worked on this from a number of institutions. And we were funded by principally by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, um, but also by DAR um, and NOAA. Uh, and then um, uh, we also had a lot of other partners who are involved in the data. So with that, uh, thank you. There's the website again. Um, this one is our main one, and it can link you to all the others. Um, that's on this thing. And there's also a little handout if you guys are interested. Um, and that's my contact information. Thanks so much. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Can we go back to the first one? Oh, sure. <laughs> Let's see. This one? Oh, this one. OK. Uh-huh. But his guesswork because mm -hmm. something in nature is. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Okay, so this was a literature review. So uh, what we did was we looked at everything that we could find that's been published on the relationships between humans and the and ecosystems in particular with regime shifts, and we asked, well, maybe it was just all drivers, actually. I didn't do this one, but I'm, I'm well, yeah, because we are interested in humans, right? Because we want to know what can we do to avoid these shifts. Um, and in that case, there, there was, they were characterizing whether there's just a linear relationship, so that means there's just a straight change. So the more impact we have, the worse it becomes in like kind of a summed fashion. Or was it nonlinear? Is there some indication that we can have a little bit of in impact, but it's really at some critical level that it drops off? And that's non where the. No, nonlinear is not necessarily bad. And actually, that's a really good point because what we're after here is, is how to manage our ecosystems for both the ecosystems themselves, but also for us, right? So we gain a lot of benefits from the ecosystem in terms of things like fishing and our, our food and the livelihoods of the fishermen to recreation and the economy that depends on that, on and on and on. And so what we want to do is figure out how can we coexist with the ecology. And so if there is a tipping point, that's actually gives us some evidence that we can uh, that we can have these things up to a certain amount, but that we ne really need to think about this kind of critical level at which we need to curb our impact in order to not have these devastating effects. Does that make sense? Does that? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> that was not me. <laughs> I can't even see it. Yeah. So, yes. Oh, you want to go in the back? Sorry, Steve. Okay. Back there. Steve? Yeah, just a question. Um, I didn't get told asked by a neighborhood involved in the King Ties project this last fall and really trying to get the citizen scientists like so we're not playing engaged. Um, are you guys now that you've identified a lot of the areas on the island, mm -hmm. are we gonna put together some kind of team to help monitor them? Okay, good question. The question was about community involvement and uh, with the example of the king tides that have been recently and the community getting out there and taking pictures and whether we would have something like that. Um, I think absolutely. Uh, we are definitely at the phase now where we've done a lot of the research and we want to kind of translate that into some impact. And so at the end of the video, they started talking about community and we found that that's a really big driving force in change. and that um, people are listening. And so we can take these results on our own. So Malama Manalua is an organization we work with. 
um, that you may be familiar with locally that, uh, that, you know, we can, we can take these results and translate them to just this place, just Hanama Bay if we want. Um, or we're also working up with the governor and at the state level to enact change at that level. So we're really interested at, at participating at all levels. So definitely get in touch with us if you have ideas for how we can translate this stuff. And and I think community action is is critical. So. Yep, exactly, right. Yes. Thank, thank you for that question. He um, asked if I, if we found any evidence of recovery. And when I was telling the Honolulu Bay example, I was kind of hitting myself for not also including an example where we've seen recovery. But actually, the regimes are a really cool way of also monitoring recovery because uh, we can see things that have gone to one or that degraded regime and come back. Um, I was actually just working on a figure today that kind of translates that story. So um, yes, we're also trying to tell that story and um, there's and definitely use the same type of uh, products to say, okay, well, where we've seen recovery in the main Hawaiian Islands, what did we do there and what was working? And can we translate that to other places? So, yeah. Yes. Okay. The question was, can we clarify the difference between a browser and a grazer? Sure. So the grazers, so they each, all of these are herbivores. So they all consume algae in one way or another. It's just the way in which they consume it and the kind of algae they consume. So the grazers really like to eat the small algae. So they, they're like a lawnmower. They kind of just take the top off and they graze and graze and graze, and then just keep that lawn perfect, one one height, and 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 they so and they'll they'll pick out all the baby algae, and it's actually really just baby algae that grows into big algae, and the big algae is the kind that we really don't want to see, um, and the browsers are the ones that will directly feed on the bigger algae, and so they have kind of each have a role, right? So it's like one's picking the weeds and one's mowing the lawn. Does that, does that help? Okay. Yeah. Any other 